It's a death investigation and mystery with a lot of bizarre facts and circumstances. A case that seems to have a lot of clues and evidence, but none which seem to make much sense. Debbie Collier, a wife and mother from Georgia, disappeared on September 10th. Her daughter Amanda grew suspicious when she received a Venmo for over $2,000, which included a cryptic message. They are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. Debbie's husband and daughter called the police. Debbie was found the next day burnt and partially naked near an embankment in the woods miles away from her home. Surveillance video from a dollar store about 15 miles from the death scene shows Debbie purchasing items including a red tote and blue tarp that were found at the scene. Where was she going and why was she buying these items? Tonight, we take a closer look at the evidence and the people connected to Debbie to try to make some sense of this bizarre story and tragic death of a mother and wife. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. And when you have a mysterious death, someone dies under unusual circumstances, it's really all about solving the case for investigators, figuring out what happened. Why did this person die? How did they die? And if it's at the hands of another, who is responsible? And you know, at the crime scene, you're, you're looking at forensic evidence, autopsy results, things like that. Then you start looking at digital evidence, things from phones, text messages, um, maybe cell phone pings. Do you try to get a location on where someone was? Try to build a timeline. It's like putting together the pieces of a puzzle. And here on Court TV, you see the results of that day after day in the trials that we watch. These are cases where investigators were able to put those pieces together. And ultimately, you know, you watch the cases and sometimes they make a lot of sense. And I've said this a lot of times, sometimes two plus two equals four. It's that simple. Investigators are able to take all these facts and circumstances and put them together for a prosecutor like I was and be able to explain to the jury exactly what happened. Most of the time. Sometimes things are a little bit more complicated, like in the case of Debbie Collier. This is a much more complicated equation that we're talking about. I mean, there are facts, there are circumstances, there are clues, there are videos, there are messages. But when you put them all together, <clears throat> as I'm sitting here tonight, they don't necessarily fit or really tell an easy story about what happened to Debbie. Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson took a closer look at all of these facts and circumstances and has this report tonight. This is surveillance video of Debbie Collier inside a family dollar store in Clayton, Georgia. The 59-year-old mother of two buying a rain poncho, torch lighter, paper towels, a tarp, and a tote bag. The very same items that would be found near her naked and partially burned body 13 miles away in this wooded area on September 11th. At this time, there is no evidence to suggest or support that this incident was related to a kidnapping or that this was a suicide. Detectives still piecing together a timeline, but say about 20 minutes after Debbie is seen at this shopping center, her daughter, Amanda Bearden, received a Venmo payment of nearly $2,300 and a disturbing cryptic message that read, they won't let me go. There is a key to the house underneath a flower pot. Later that day, Debbie's husband, Steve, reported her missing. Police would use satellite radio to find her unlocked rental car and a police dog to locate her body in the woods of Habersham County. The black Pacifica van that had been reported missing out of Athens, Clark County, tied to Debbie Collier, a van that she had rented, according to her daughter. And I was very surprised to find it off a major highway, US 441, which is the main road connecting North Georgia and Western North Carolina, and the law enforcement officials and crime scene tape were right there um, in plain view of all the the passers-by it's a heavily trafficked route 
According to the incident report, Debbie's daughter was alerted by police of the car's location and arrived at the scene in a hysterical state. After a canine was brought in, Debbie's body was located down an embankment, nude and partially burned. Police say her right hand grasping a small tree and remains of a fire nearby. Court TV visited her Athens, Georgia neighborhood. Friends and family are still too shaken to talk on camera, but told us Debbie and her husband Steve kept to themselves. Her son Jeffrey Bearden posted this message on Facebook about his mother. In part it reads, it is with the deepest sadness that I share my mother passed earlier this month. I will never be able to fully articulate the loss of my mother and what she meant to me. She was my longest source of love, support, and encouragement. My mother was very vibrant and a strong soul. Our grief is here and our pain is deep. I am asking that you please respect our privacy while we learn to cope and adjust with our loss. It is not appropriate to publish speculation about my family. I ask that all attention on this tragic story of my mother's death remain focused on aiding the police investigation. What happened here? They're, they're, these are strange facts that don't really fit some sort of very obvious story about what happened to Debbie Collier. Joining me in studio right now, Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson. Matt, this story, wow, I'm trying to figure it out. Let's start with Debbie Collier. What do we know about her? We're still digging into this story. A nice to see you, Vinny. And we are learning more about her and her relationships. What we know is that uh, Debbie Collier was 59 years old. She was a mother in Athens, Georgia. She was married. She got married later in life to her husband, Steve. She worked as an assistant for a nearby realtor. Last seen on September 10th at a family dollar store in Clayton, Georgia. She was seen right there in that surveillance video at around 2.55 p.m. entering the store. Then at around 3.08, she was seen at the checkout counter. She was buying a red tote, paper towels, a poncho, a tarp, a torch lighter, one for like the barbecue. She is seen leaving the store about a minute later. I'm looking at her. It's mm -hmm. a Saturday. It's Georgia. She lives in Athens. That's the home of the Georgia Bulldogs. That's right. It's game day, and this is about an hour before kickoff. And she's dressed with, it looks like, a red Bulldogs jersey. The things that she's buying, to me, seem consistent with someone maybe going to a tailgate. Yeah, and she's buying a red tote to go along with it matching the Bulldogs' colors. It's, it's unbelievable that you can go from this moment, and then it's shortly after that moment where she's checking out, was about 10 minutes or so, nine minutes, that the Venmo message is sent, or $2,000 mm -hmm. to her daughter and that really cryptic message. Very cryptic message, and I really think that that is what perked a lot of uh, police response right away. So here's what we know. Police responded to a missing persons report um, the very same day that she goes missing. But she's reported missing by her husband, Steve, at around 6 o'clock, 6.08 on September 10th. And her husband, Steve, tells police the last time that he saw his wife was around 9 o'clock the night before. They sleep in separate rooms because he snores. And the next morning on the 11th, her rental car still in the driveway. He thinks that she's home. As for her daughter, Amanda Bearden, she tells police that around 317, her mom sent $2,385 through Venmo along with that message, that cryptic message that says, they're not going to let me go. They, they are they not going to let me go. are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in a blue flower pot by the door. The daughter also tells police that Debbie didn't take anything with her but her license and debit card. But we saw she had what looked like a purse in that surveillance video. Right. And if she's Venmoing, you do that off a of phone. Right. So she had her phone with her. I think she does, right? If she's going to send a Venmo. She and the daughter, have... Amanda, tries to call her back as soon as she gets that weird message. But she and no an one answer. answers. She doesn't answer. Yeah. And she's got the visor on, too, the red visor. Right? Oh, she's all decked out for the game. Well, a visor tells me you're expecting to be outside, right? You're not wearing a visor to be indoors somewhere, and she's got the... Unless the, she wears the, it all the time. We don't know. That's true. All right. Um, so she disappears on Saturday, game day, September 10th. Correct. Her body's found the next day. 
On the 11th, right. You got that right. Um, her car is first found because police do something brilliant, in my opinion. They, they start pinging the um, Sirius XM in the car because she's using a rental car. She was recently in a car accident, according to some of the reporting that I've seen. So she had this rental car. They keep track of those cars, and it had the Sirius XM in it. So they located in a wooded area in Clarksville, Georgia. A sheriff's canine is then brought in because it's a wooded area, and the deputies find a red tote, partially burned blue tarp, and Debbie's partially burned nude body. She was dead. She was grasping a tiny tree off of a ravine. Okay, that's again, all of this is not making a ton of sense no. uh, to me. The tarp is burnt. Her abdomen area is slightly burnt. She's naked, partially naked. Partially naked. Grasping a tree. It, it, it makes no, and she just had purchased this stuff and now she's in the woods with it mm -hmm. and her car is there. Uh, and again, they use the, the Sirius XM to track her. Which right? is great, genius. Right, but we usually track people with the phone. But her phone was turned off because police had been trying to call her throughout the day along with her daughter Amanda, no, no call is answered. Yeah. No answer, okay. Now, let's talk about her daughter Amanda, because mm -hmm. um, she's obviously close to her mom. She gets this, this Venmo, but she has a boyfriend too, and there's a little bit of a history that these two have. Yeah, and that history is documented, right? So they have a bit of a tumultuous relationship, um, some DV involved there. History of the boyfriend, wow. Okay, so this is the body cam video of that boyfriend. This is from Georgia police that shows an incident back in September of 2021, about a year ago, and it shows Andrew Gierkovich uh, arrested at Amanda's home for violating a no contact order. In a video, um, he accuses Amanda of stealing money from him to buy drugs. Um, there's accusations that she's had a drug problem. Amanda says that she is scared of him and that he was trying to break in her house at the time. And that's why um, he got in trouble this time. Okay. So a lot of people are talking about this, right? Because you've got people that have some level of interaction with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, we see police here with, with the boyfriend. There's a tumultuous relationship than the mentioning of drugs as well. Right. That's another big factor here, because he's accusing the daughter of taking money from him. From his paychecks. Right. Five and six hundred dollars at a time to if buy you, drugs. To buy drugs. And my understanding is he's recently been arrested for a violation of probation. Right. So there's a history of violations. There's a history of arrests with, with him that we know of. This, and, and obviously people, you have to look at people that have a history with law enforcement. You gotta look at everyone that's close to her first, but I mean, it could be, have something to do with someone closer, it could have something to do with a complete stranger. I mean, we, we just don't really, and police have not mentioned any suspects or anything at this point. No suspects, but they were quick to say that they don't think that it's suicide or a kidnapping. So they've quickly it's said it's yeah. not a, and everything you look at, it's like, well, did she buy these things and when she's gonna take her own life in the woods? Was she kidnapped? Was she brought there? But they're saying both of those scenarios, no. That's what they say. Matt Johnson, great work today. This is, this is, Thank you, sir. This is the definition of a mystery at this point. Absolute mystery. Appreciate your time. When we come back, we're going to bring in our investigators also coming up next hour. In Bismarck, North Dakota, Nikki Ensel accused of cheating on her husband and plotting his murder to collect life insurance. Nikki's ex-lover has already pleaded guilty in the case and is set to testify at her trial. We are live in North Dakota for day one of the trial. She admitted to being in the home when Chad died, but she still denies having anything to do with the murder. A senseless tragedy in small-town America. This was a pre-planned execution. It was a feud between families that ended with multiple murders. They came in like thieves in the night and took eight lives. George Wagner faces murder charges in connection with the killer. Wagner's brother and parents also charged. It's very much a family affair. All for one, one for all. It's a chilling story. It will be an intense trial. The Ohio Family Massacre Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings on Court TV. Clark County Police Department informed Sheriff's Office deputies of the missing person report.
tied to the vehicle and that the last communication from the missing person was a transfer to the daughter of $2,385 with a text message tied to the Venmo transfer stating, they won't let me go. There is a key to the house underneath the flower pot. It's a very cryptic message. Uh, Debbie Collier found dead in the woods. Incredibly tragic. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's a real mystery tonight. Exactly what happened to Debbie. Um, I want to put a, a timeline up on the screen just to try to give it some sort of framework for one of these really um, strange clues in the case. 255, Debbie is on surveillance video at a family dollar. This is in Clayton, Georgia. 308. She checks out at that family dollar. She purchases a red tote bag, a poncho, a torch lighter, uh, a pack of paper towels, and a blue tarp. 309, she is seen leaving the family dollar store. Then just eight minutes later, 317, Debbie's daughter receives a, a suspicious Venmo transaction for $2,385 from the account her mother and father share. And um, there's a, a message. Debbie's daughter um, said that the, the message said, they are not going to let me go. Love you. There is a key to the house in the blue flower pot by the door. What does that mean? Let's put the pieces together. We need to bring in a team tonight, a team of investigators, and we've done it for you. Joining me tonight in Chicago, Illinois, private investigator Erica Morse. In New York City, retired deputy inspector, New York Police Department, author of Once a Cop, Corey Pegues is with us. In Jacksonville, Alabama, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University, former senior investigator for the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office, that's in Georgia, and host of an incredible podcast, it's called Body Bags, Joseph Scott Morgan. And in Salt Lake City, Utah, retired police commander and the host of the Profiling Evil podcast, Mike King is with us. Thank you, everyone. Let's start, and I want to focus on this Venmo transfer and this message, which is just eight minutes after we see her in that video leaving the Family Dollar store. Um, Erica Morris, why don't you get us started off with your thoughts about, about that? Hey, Vinny. Um, number one rule of investigations, follow the money. Um, there is something that came up in this investigation that has caught my eye, and that is the shared bank account. Um, there is a history of domestic violence with the daughter and her boyfriend, and law enforcement must rule in or rule out who accessed that Venmo after the money was transferred and nail down exactly how that money was sent through that app. Um, because there is significant reference in a lot of this coverage about the daughter's ex-boyfriend being very upset about this money that was stolen because she convinced him to get a shared bank account. So it doesn't actually seem that odd to me that we're focused on a Venmo transaction. Um, there's a lot of DV there. There's a lot of violations of ROs. And when you start by really looking in at the family dynamics and this, this very strange and mysterious cash transfer, to me, it doesn't seem that difficult. Um, that's where I would start. Um, Corey Pegues, they are not going to let me go. Who, who are they? What, who are they or is it more important who write, wrote this text message? Was it actually uh debbie yeah thank again Vinny. thanks and hello to all the distinguished guests listen i think that the uh the text message is definitely a throw off it's definitely a throw off um and i'm i don't know why they ruled out uh suicide and, and kidnapping you know season detectives would never just throw that right out you know everything's open until we could solve this case but the day part i think it is almost like as if someone had her phone and wrote the message and told them about the key just to throw the investigators off that's what i truly believe joseph scott morgan what are you thinking tonight as we we sift through this first piece of evidence that is to me very important, significant. It's the last 
alleged communication that she made with anyone in the world. Yeah, what, what kind of strikes me curious about this, being familiar with the geography in that area, is the fact that, you know, her body was found in Habersham County, which is actually south, but north of where she lived, uh, south of where she was seen at the store. She's up in Clayton, Georgia, uh, Vinny. This is 15 miles north. This is literally the last stop that you really have uh, for a sizable kind of town before you go over the North Carolina border. I think the reporter had mentioned this earlier. It was in one of the reports. This is a kind of a major north-south route uh, headed through that, that area of the country. I find it curious that she would live in Athens, but yet she would go so far north and then her body would be found uh, to the south, significantly to the south, Ben. And, you know, I'm looking at this video of, you know, where she's uh, in the store. And one of the things I think that, you know, our colleagues in the FBI and this sort of thing that profile, you know, these kidnapping events, you look for duress many times. Uh, and she, you know, she just appears, Ben, to be going about her business. Um, she I, looks I like she's I going to be, a bulldog tailgate, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah, she does. And there was a ball game that day. And, you know, and I, I know I'm stating the obvious, but I would be very curious about CCTV from across the road. You know, it's all fine and good that we have this. I'd like to know if there was anybody traveling in tandem and back to what was said about Venmo, the other key part to this is going to be phone communications. Remember, these two phones from both the boyfriend and the daughter have been taken up by the police. And, you know, I'm thinking about the Gooch case out of New Mexico and Arizona. I don't know if you remember that with the Mennonite, young Mennonite woman that was killed. Um, you know, they had those phones traveling in tandem. And I'd like to know if there was anybody else that was kind of caravanning up this way. Remember... She's got a bad back, and where she was found, um, I can't imagine she would, you know, egress through that wooded, thick wooded area down into that ravine. I think that there's somebody else involved. Um, we'll see what the evidence bears out, though, from the scene and hopefully from the autopsy whenever it's released. Mike King, I am so obsessed with this Venmo transaction because, again, nine minutes afterwards, and Joseph Scott Morgan did a great job of laying out the geography here. That dollar store is about 15, because Court TV uh, producers were up there today, it's about 15 minutes, 15 miles or so north of where her car is found. So if she went straight from the, the dollar store to where her car ended up, that Venmo would have to be sent while she's driving on that road. Otherwise, um, something else is happening. Something else is happening. What are your thoughts about the, the sending of this money and the timing of it all? The, uh, the money is a, a really big part of this thing, and we can't discount that. I, I'm so frustrated with this without having more information because you're absolutely right. Why did she go so far north? She would have passed a lot of locations that she could have purchased those items. So was she compelled to go that direction is the first question. And, and it's going to be really interesting. I'm really glad Joe Scott's on because I, I have so many questions in regard to the forensics of this. I want to see what the bottom of her feet look like. Did she trounce down through that, that countryside or was she transported there and this was a stage scene uh, the the fact that her hands against the tree is that a, a representation that somebody's made that venmo money is huge and i think the thing that's bugging me the most about that vinnie is the transaction that apparently got everyone so spun up that was three hours before she was reported missing and holy cow i'm thinking if uh, somebody in my family said hey they're not going to let me go and here's some money and find the key under the the uh, pot, I'd be making a call a whole lot quicker than three hours. Yeah, because the daughter's making calls, and then I see Corey Pegues is, is nodding his head along with you, because um, the daughter said she called and got no answer after getting that Venmo, Corey. Yeah, but <laughs> three hours, if my mom is missing after three hours and we know she's coming back, I can't answer her phone. She has a bad back. Like, it's all of these different factors. I'm calling for my mom immediately. I'm calling the police, you know, just like he said. I was 
perplexed when I found out they called three hours late. Not only did the daughter, but now we have to bring in the husband also because they called together. Why would it take them three? First, the husband didn't see her uh, since the previous night. She left the location. You can't get in contact with her, and you wait three hours to call her. That doesn't make sense to me. So when you look at this whole tangled web, somebody in that family might have something to do with this murder. When we come back, we're going to take you to the scene of the crime and give you some of the information that we're getting about exactly where Debbie Collier was found and some more of the details of um, what was in that incident report as well. Unbelievable. Debbie Collier, what happened to this mom and this wife? <laughs> A Habersham County Sheriff's Office K-9 unit responded to the scene and initiated a search. The search resulted in the locating of a red tote bag, a partially burnt blue and color tarp, and eventually the victim's partially nude and burnt body grasping a small tree down a ravine. The victim was deceased. Call our helpline now. At this time, there is no evidence to suggest or support that this incident was related to a kidnapping or that this was a suicide. That's significant, extremely significant. One of the first things we heard from the sheriff in the, in the death of Debbie Collier in the woods is that it was not suicide and wasn't nothing to indicate kidnapping either. I mean, what does that leave? That leaves, that leaves I guess, homicide could be an accident, accidental death. Um, Clearly not natural causes. Uh, as we look at this, let me read for you some from the uh, incident report. Significant stuff. Um, officers proceeded south, southeast into the woods where they found a red tote bag near an uprooted tree. Remember, that's the bag she just purchased that day. Sergeant Neal observed a red tote bag laid on its side near an uprooted tree. At the root of the tree, Sergeant Neal observed what appeared to be the remains of a fire. As he approached the fire, he looked further down the embankment. Sergeant Neal observed what appeared to be a partially burnt, blue in color tarp. That's the tarp she just bought at the dollar store. He observed a nude female, and now we're understanding it's partially nude, laying on her back, grasping a small tree with her right hand. Sergeant Neal observed Collier's remains to be apparently burned with what appeared to be charring to her abdomen. Let's bring back in our guests, Erica Morse, Corey Pegues, Joseph Scott Morgan, Mike King. Uh, we've got all our investigators lined up tonight. Joseph Scott Morgan, you've been to many death scenes before. Um, let's, let's talk first, though, about quickly saying no evidence of a kidnapping or suicide. What would it be at a scene that would tell you no way was this a suicide. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter um, in the media and on social media in particular where people have mentioned this idea of self-immolation where people, you know, and I've, I think in the course of my multi-decade career, I may have worked two self-immolations and that means where you douse yourself with gas to take your life and you set yourself on fire. To the best of our knowledge at this point in time, there are no gas containers that that they make note of in this report that are immediately adjacent to the body. And this this burning is limited to a very specific area. Well, let, let me rephrase that. Um, he stated that there was charring to the abdomen. And so does that mean that there are other degrees of burns on the body and then specific to charring? Uh, and I find it very curious here in that, um, you know, we had, we've heard We've heard people say, well, the body was nude. Now we're hearing it's partially nude, uh, that she's wearing clothes on the lower half of her body, but she's absent a shirt. Remember that shirt that we saw in the video, Ben? The the bulldog shirt. I right. wonder if that's the one that she's absent up top. Where's the shirt? Where is it? They don't make any mention of that at this point in time. And the fact that they would jump to this idea that this is not a suicide, that means that they've eliminated things like methodologies in order to take your life. 
uh, you know, gunshot wound in the head is, I mean, arguably the most common uh, hanging. If there's any number of places out in this wooded area she could have hung herself. There was apparently no evidence of that. Toxicology is pending, I would imagine. Uh, so we don't know what she might have uh, on board relative to anything that might be in her system at this point. That's going to take some time. But they haven't released anything from the state medical examiner and through the Haversham County coroner relative to any hints here other than, which is really bizarre, we're ruling out suicide. It's off the table at this point. So they're looking at something else. And I, I agree with you. She didn't just accidentally fall down this ravine and there happened to be a burn spot up top, a burn on her body and a partially burned tarp down below. Those things just don't add up. It's, it's super bizarre to say the very least. Mike King, does this strike you as any sort of ritual type killing, a serial killer, a, 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 some evil mind that is going to torture this poor woman for whatever reason? Not, not at all, Vinny. This one really, to me, goes back to the victimology. Who's this? Uh, th who's this individual, Debbie? Is she a high-risk individual or is she low-risk? And I think everything about her, there's no criminal history that I could see. She has a job. She's been doing the same thing day in and day out. She dresses modestly. Uh, this is what I would classify as a low-risk individual. And the only way low-risk victims by statistics become victims is that something happens in the circumstances they're in or the environment. So is it possible that she could have been victimized by an opportunistic killer out there that just happened to glump along at the same moment that she happens to be leaving? It's possible, but again, it doesn't make sense when she takes this drive so far, an hour plus drive north, and then ends up back there. And, and this is where I think it's so important as we think about that victimology that we then start thinking about the crime scenes. And is this really the crime scene where the death occurs or is this a place that her body is disposed later and disposed of? We know her back is bad. She's not gonna be hiking down there without a whole lot of trouble. And again, I go back and, and Joe Scott, I wanna ask you that. I mean, how important are looking at the feet right now? Yeah, her feet are very important. I'm glad you brought that up because if she is uh, not wearing shoes, there would obviously be trace evidence on the surface of those feet. And one other point I must make up, I must make uh, right here, uh, that vehicle, that vehicle is an evidence rich environment. I think, you know, if, if something nefarious has happened to her, which, you know, kind of all signs point that direction uh, goes without saying, who occupied that same space with her and how carefully did they utilize uh, everything at their disposal to process that. One other thing, you know, in a lot of the videography, our producers do a fantastic job, don't they, Ben? Uh, just wonderful. Uh, these shots that they're showing of the rain falling out there. Rain's a bad thing from a forensic standpoint, but um, if the ground was wet out there and she has her own body weight if somebody carried her out there you could be looking at sets of footprints out there that would obviously be larger than hers probably because she would have to be conveyed down there if this is a dump site i hope that they took care out there to preserve anything <clears throat> relative to anything that might be left of, left left there that's going to be some essence of someone else that was in this environment i want to put up something else from the incident report uh, some more details here. The female was laying on the ground, her feet facing down, downhill, her head up. She had no top on. Her skin appeared black and red in places as if she was burnt. Her right hand was grasping onto a small tree that was to her right. Erica Morse, what do you think of the scene where Debbie Collier was found? There's a lot of... A lot of insinuation here that there could be some staging involved. I'm wondering if this was an attempt to throw off investigators. And the reason I say that is because of that text message. That text message leads me to believe that it was sent by someone with intimate knowledge of her day-to-day -day environment because of the reference to that key in the flower pot. So therefore, was there an attempt to throw off investigators by staging this, this area? 
Um, again, to Joseph's credit, I don't know that we can call this the crime scene. Is this just the site where she was, where she, where she was left to be found? Um, if so, they have to muddy through what is real and what is made to throw off investigators. That's why this is taking so much time. And that's why they, you know, they have to take their time to get it right. All right, when we come back, we've got some body cam footage of Debbie's daughter and her daughter's boyfriend. We'll show that to you, plus, coming up next hour. In Sullivan County, Tennessee, the tragic death of baby Evelyn. Her teenage mom, Megan Boswell, accused of the murder. And now we are learning some newly revealed details from the investigation, including the gruesome death scene. Was this little angel wrapped up and tossed in the trash upside down to suffer while she suffocated? I've been so long without her, and I know a lot of people are like, oh, why didn't you put it missing earlier? Because my mom threatened me, and I just want her back. 911. We got active shooter. Look out, look out, look out. I was shot in the face. People everywhere, bodies everywhere, chaos everywhere. This is just a kid. How did he get here? Were there moments where you second guessed yourself? No. There's no one way to say this person is or this person isn't going to become a mass shooter. Court TV presents Rampage Killers. Premieres Sunday, 9, 8 Central, only on Court TV. of her stealing my money, and that's all I want, is my money and my stuff. You've been living here? I haven't recently, but she's still been taking money from my car, and that's the only reason we've had any contact, because every week she takes five or six hundred dollars from my check, and I just don't see how that's right, and she, go, she goes and does dope with my money. Like, I, yeah. And I've made over... Thirty, forty thousand dollars this year, and I'm completely broke because she spends it all on drugs. And that's the boyfriend of Debbie Collier's daughter, Amanda. Okay, now that same day, this is September of 2021. Uh, that same day, you can hear from Amanda on the body cam, uh, giving her take on what is happening in what is clearly a tumultuous uh, situation between these two. So what, what happened? What time did he show up? He, he started messaging me on Facebook. Yeah. I thought we were broken up. Yeah. And he got home. My window was previously broken. This one? Yeah. He was, trying to, well, he was trying to break it in. And he was, he messaged people on Facebook, my friends, saying that I was cheating on him. Yeah. I never cheated on anybody in my life. He, I don't know where he gets his ideas. I was just like, okay, psycho, yeah. have a good day. Yeah. And the next thing I know, he's, he's, he's at my front. He's at the front door. Yeah, actually. He's probably been here. I, I might have called 911 three or four minutes. Okay. After, I know. After he was here, y'all talking to the door? Yeah. Okay. Did y'all get face to face or anything? Yeah. Is it just the door? You just knew it was him? He's scared. Okay. And finally, one more piece of information. This is being reported by the New York Post. Uh, they actually had a picture of it uh, in, in the paper, um, which is a note allegedly written by the boyfriend. Okay? By the boyfriend. It says, have a nice life, you lying blank, blank. Don't ever contact me again. If you or your family ever come near me again, I will hurt them. Let's bring back in our guests, Erica Morris, Corey Pegues, Justice Scott Morgan, Mike King, our investigators with us tonight. Corey, uh, what are your thoughts about what you saw in the body cam and this alleged note written by the boyfriend a year ago? Yeah, well, the, the guy, the boyfriend would definitely, I would take, I think Joe and Mike and Erica would agree. We would have to have several 
interviews with this person. He has to be consistent in every single answer to our questions. You got to see if there's any holes in his story. Uh, you know, the body cam video, this was a very volatile situation. He's been locked up several times. Her background with all her old boyfriends, she's been locked up for arguing with old boyfriends. This was a mess. And that, that note, just in specific, that note that he left, immediately he would be somebody as an investigator that I would really be looking at. And it's not far-fetched. We've seen it too many times on court TV that the daughter might be involved in this situation with her mother because I'm still stuck on three hours waiting to call the police. Why did it take three hours to call after your mother left you that very, very suspicious text message? Erica Morris, this is a, a really, uh, you know, a tumultuous relationship situation. Police are responding, um, and that note, that note is, you know, could be he could be could have some of the worst luck in the world that he writes a threatening note a year before um, someone dies under very mysterious circumstances. I don't think it's coincidence. We know that there aren't coincidences in these types of investigations. I feel like it's foreshadowing. Um, I really feel like Debbie Collier was collateral damage in a an ugly and ongoing and tumultuous domestic violence situation. Um, you know, it's too early right now for them to, for law enforcement to pin down anyone because there is such a mountain of evidence to go through. But statistics exist for a reason. And this case is a prime example of why those statistics exist. Um, as previously mentioned, it was it was Joe or Mike that Debbie was a low risk individual or appeared to be a low risk um, victim. And that same thing cannot be said about the generation underneath her. There is an extensive history. There's an extensive um, criminal history. There's substance abuse allegations, a lot of domestic violence involved, a lot of violence, the ignoring of restraining orders and parole violations that indicates that rules aren't easily followed by these individuals. So, um, you know, of course, more will come out and, and we will learn more as we go. But my gut instincts exist as an investigator for a reason. And it is it is because we are trained to look for these consistencies and in investigations. Mike King, you know, I look at all this, all these issues and then I go back to the video from the, the dollar store and I'm trying to understand why she's purchasing these things that end up at the crime scene. And, and, and again, going back to the beginning of my show, you know, trying to make two plus two equal four, I just can't do it here. I, th I think that's exactly right. It's really troubling. And, and when we get the answer, I think it's going to make perfect sense, Vinny. Uh, we don't know if, if this woman is preparing to go to a game and all of that is part of uh, tailgating like you were suggesting. And that without her knowing, somebody was tracking her and following her. While I said this is a low-risk victim, there's no question that while she may not have known who the predator was going to be, the predator was completely aware and this was a planned attack it was a targeted attack it had a reason behind it there are some suspects in this case uh, haven't been named yet that that we're going to see the means and the motive but this thing is going to come together and it's going to make perfect sense and i think as it unfolds it's going to be less likely that it was someone calling and telling her pick up these items because i think we would have seen a much more disheveled um, amount of behavior by her uh, handshaking and other kinds of things as she's at that cash register putting her card in uh, i think this is going to be opportunistic but it was planned not not just happened to be two paths that crossed at the wrong spot joseph scott morgan we have about uh 40 seconds, 35 seconds or so. I'll give you the final word tonight from our investigative team. Autopsy, autopsy, autopsy. That's what I'm waiting on. I want to see what this woman endured, Vinny, because, you know, I, I don't know that I have had more anticipation over a cause of death in a case in my recent memory, and I cover cases every day than this case. I'm waiting to hear what the Habersham County Coroner's Office says. And I suspect, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I suspect we'll be waiting a few more days because I think uh, they're 
trying to cover all of their bases and they're waiting on talks. But I'm going to be very curious to see what level of violence was involved in these circumstances that brought about uh, Debbie's death. Joseph Scott Morgan, thank you so much. I know we're going to see you next hour uh, in our case out of Tennessee. But Erica Morris, Corey Pegues, Mike King, awesome. Appreciate you jumping in tonight and, um, and really shedding some light on where the answers may be in this case. We'll speak.